trying to figure out, you know, And we have water right there. Water. I'm going to get everyone's attention like in a minute. Can I ask everyone to please who can I ask everyone to please find a seat? We'll start the program in just a moment.
Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. I'm John Miko, the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. Of course, for tonight, the bar is an important component of the subject for this evening. I have never seen so many martini glasses at a library hour, uh, perhaps uh, ever. Uh, so kudos to those that are ordering properly. Um, a few housekeeping items, if I could start with, please take a moment to silence your cell phone. Tonight's program will include a Q&A &A portion. We'll be utilizing the microphones, and please do use the microphones as we are streaming live and we need to be able to hear your questions. I will moderate the uh, questions, so just raise your hand and staff will come up with, uh, with a microphone. Uh, a couple of upcoming programs. We have two more wonderful programs in the next two weeks. Uh, next week, we have a Liberty Series with Michael Gerhardt. Michael is, among other things, uh, the scholar in residence at the National Constitution, one of, the, um, uh, one of the great constitutional law experts uh, that we have in this country. And he's going to talk about presidential impeachments. Uh, so that should be interesting. And then the following week, on the 5th of, of February, we have a public affairs program on the is Israel-Hamas war. That's on 2-5. And then, of course, Lincoln Day on the 12th of February, one of the biggest days of the year uh, at the Union League, of course, and for the Legacy Foundation. And on that day, among other things, with all the pomp that we do with our parade at the luncheon and speakers, uh, we will also have an announcement. The announcement will be about a civics initiative, a national civics initiative, uh, and I hope you'll be there for that. If you're not, you will hear more about this in the coming uh, weeks. Um, and that initiative and all that we do at the Legacy Foundation, scholarship, civics education, the care of this great collection that is in this house and in the, in the uh, vault in the Legacy Foundation, all of that happens through the leadership and generosity of our league members. So I thank all of you who have given so generously, who have led um, so generously, and, and given of yourself as well. Uh, we could not do what we do without you, and we need more of you to do more uh, as we move forward. Uh, there is probably no better um, person, leader, that I know at the Union League of Philadelphia than the person who's going to introduce this program. He is the a member of our executive committee. He is the chair of the education committee. He's the new chair of our strategic planning committee. Uh, he is a generous man in every aspect, a great union league leader. Please welcome my friend, Mr. Steve Target, who will introduce our program. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll, I'll, I'll um, back up John's endorsement of Lincoln Day. If you haven't signed up for Lincoln Day, please do. It's one of the most meaningful days here at the Union League. It's an absolute blast. We've got an amazing speaker this year. It's going to be a it's going to be a, a, a wonderful day. So we'll kick off this evening uh, by introducing our speaker, Dr. Ronald Granieri. Granieri is a professor of history in the Department of National Security and, St and Strategy at the United States Army War College and is a Templeton Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. A graduate of Harvard and the University of Chicago, Dr. Granieri is the author of The Ambivalent Alliance, as well as articles on German history, European-American relations, the Cold War, and contemporary politics in journals such as Orbis, Central European History, Foreign Policy, and the International History and Re History Review. He's also published up 
Ed S. Essays in the Hill, the Washington Post. He's spoken at the Union League on several occasions, including the 2014 series of lectures marketing, marking the 100th anniversary of World War I. His talk tonight is on his newest book, The Bondian Cold War, The Transnational Legacy of a Cultural Icon. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Professor Ron Guarneri. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody here at the Union League for being here. I am humble enough and realistic enough to know that you're not all here tonight because of me. You're here all. To, you're here tonight because of the guy that I'm going to be talking about, uh, and and I'm okay with that. But yes, this is a. Uh, this is a chance to talk about something of a passion project for me, which is I'm a historian of the Cold War I, I, and, and various things. I teach national security policy and strategy at the Army War College, but I, have, I am a lifelong uh, aficionado, fan, know-it-all about James Bond. <clears throat> and to have the chance to talk to you tonight about, this, this, uh, about my research and about the book which I brought a copy which I'm actually John I'm going to this is my donation to the uh, to the collection at the uh, at the Union League I'm saving the Union League 170 bucks which is how much these books cost so um, yeah I'll, I'll, you could you could give me a receipt afterwards right <laughs> but um, tax deductible exactly right um, but I'm so delighted to be here to talk to you about James Bond and uh, um, I'm going to talk about Bond in, as I say, uh, an analysis of the Bond and the Bonding Cold War in uh, 007 hashtags. Uh, I'm going to talk for, uh, you know, I could talk for as long or as little as you like, but I am going to try to keep this under control so that we can have uh, Q&A afterwards. But to talk about James Bond is we're, we're not just talking about an, uh, a, uh, well, I would say Bond is a piece of transatlantic uh, and global culture, if you will. Um, there are few characters in the English language, in English language literature, who have the kind of broad cross-platform uh, longevity as James Bond, right? I'm, when, when you think off the top of your head, you know, who else um, uh, uh, has, has inspired this same level of interest and variety of presentations, right? Sherlock Holmes comes to mind, right? People don't always think of him the same way, but, um, but that's one. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's awfully hard. I mean, I've, in, in the book itself, we talk about uh, different characters that come to mind in a, in, a, in a more niche way, right? The idea of having the same character played by multiple actors over time and everybody pretends that they don't notice that it's different actors, right? James Bond is basically, uh, is Doctor Who for much cooler people. Um, <laughs> Um, but there are, there's a variety of ways to think about James Bond. And James Bond is a child of the Cold War, if you will. But the Bondian Cold War, right, the Cold War that James Bond fights is very different from the actual Cold War. And it's interesting about the, the intersection between literature uh, and commerce, let's say. And also interesting to see a character uh, change, develop, move along with the times, right? The very first James Bond novel, Casino Royale, was published in 1953. Um, and so James Bond has been with us for 71 years. Um, the, first, uh, the first filmed version of a James Bond story, um, everybody gets this wrong, but now you're going to get it right from now on, was actually on American television. Um, in the late 1950s, um, with Barry Nelson playing Jimmy Bond, an American agent um, in Casino Royale. Um, uh, the first film, of course, was with Sean Connery in 1962. Um, and we have been going strong ever since. Um, but I'm going to talk about James Bond in, in, in a variety of ways. I'm going to talk a little bit about Bond. I'm going to talk about the study of Bond. Um, I'm going to move a little fast through the slides because I will say on the drive here along the Schuylkill Expressway, I wish I had a jet pack <laughs> or, a, or an, uh, a, a car that would turn into an airplane um, or heck, um, if we'd been able to drive over the edge of the Schuylkill Expressway, right, a car that turned into a submarine would have been nice too. I did have the beautiful companion, my wife Jennifer, who's here in the front row, um, so that much I had covered. <laughs> 
And I did get here in time to have a martini in advance, although I have to say that I, I disagree with James Bond in one thing is that I prefer gin to vodka. But this is a, uh, this is, we can have, that's right, we can have this discussion, thank you very much. But I didn't, I could have, and actually we talked about this a little bit, I could have asked for a Vesper, which of course is the one cocktail recipe that is in Casino Royale, the first novel, which is, which is a cocktail with the addition of uh, a Lille Rouge, um, and, uh, uh, and it is, uh, I, I have not really had many opportunities to have a, a Vesper, and I didn't bring the recipe with me, so I didn't want to overtax the waitstaff at the, um, at the Union League, but maybe we could do that over dinner, I'm not sure. Um, it is worth noting, uh, before I move on, just to say that in the novels, actually, James Bond is not restricted to, uh, uh, to martinis. Um, in fact, the first chapter of the novel Goldfinger, the title is Reflections in a Double Bourbon. Um, so James Bond was, a, was an equal opportunity uh, <laughs> misbehavior, let's put it that way. Anyway, so I got to say, taking the Bondian Cold War seriously, right, this, this book um, is the product of both, in, both uh, individual enthusiasm uh, a sort of fandom and scholarship is in 2019, um, my colleagues, uh, uh, Martin Brown, this is Martin here, but my colleagues, uh, uh, Martin Brown, but also myself here and my colleague Muriel Blave there in the middle, um, the three of us organized a conference in of all places, Tallinn, Estonia in June of 2019. Martin, who is an Englishman who's married to an Estonian woman, was a visiting professor at the University of Tallinn in Estonia. And so in June of 2019, we held a conference, an international conference of various scholars to talk about aspects of James Bond. And that is the basis of this book. And if you've never been to Tallinn, Estonia, I gotta tell you, you're missing something. It is lovely, um, although more lovely in June than it would be, say, today, for example, right? It would be a little different. But, um, but that's the, the origins of this. And actually in the, um, uh, in, in the beginning here, right, this was the, this was the poster that we used for the conference, um, which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased with. I think it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Anyway, so taking the Cold War, taking James Bond seriously, right, understanding who is James Bond, right? Here's a, an image from, from the movie uh, Moonraker, uh, James Bond, uh, Roger Moore with, uh, with Richard Keel. Um, uh, this is one of my favorites, you know, just so you, you know, some people can be cool even when they're being decidedly uncool. And that is, that is Sir Sean Connery during the filming of Dr. No, um, showing off some of his uh, muscular moves. But um, there's some interesting things about James Bond, right? That James Bond is, is James Bond a spy? If you speak to any intelligence professional, they would tell you that James Bond is most assuredly not a spy. Right, a guy who basically within about five minutes of every movie is completely known to whoever he is <laughs> chasing after. You know, being a spy is about kind of keeping a lower profile than James Bond keeps. Um, in some ways, and this is, this, this is actually something that you know, scholars argue about, the people who study Bondology argue about, James Bond is a special operator. Right? James Bond's an assassin, um, which is very different from being a spy even though he does uncover secret information. And indeed, in, in the opening novel, one of the things in the, my, my chapter in this particular book, my, the one uh, was about the relationship, James Bond is a transatlantic hero. And what's very interesting is that in Casino Royale, the entire plot of Casino Royale, the first novel, written by Ian Fleming, who was a member of naval intelligence during the Second World War, who was uh, connected to MI6, and so who knew the intelligence world and had all of the connections that go with that. The plot of Casino Royale, the original plot, is the Western allies see an opportunity to create a problem for Le Chiffre, a, uh, a paymaster for communist agents in the West, that Le Chiffre is a gambler, and Le Chiffre is deep in debt to various uh, to various loan sharks. And he has used money given to him by the Soviet Union to gamble. And he needs to, he has taken over the bank at the Casino Royale, where he's hoping by playing Baccarat to win back enough money to pay back the money that he has stolen before the Soviets realize that all the money is gone. 
right? So this is an interesting plot, right? A lot of people don't, don't know this part of the plot. And the idea is that the Western intelligence agencies think this is a great opportunity, that if they can keep Le Chiffre from winning back the money that he has lost, that they can disrupt a series of Soviet spy networks in the West. So you need somebody who knows how to play Baccarat to go to the Casino Royale and beat Le Chiffre. And so the interesting thing is that the, it is the British, the British and the Americans talk this over and the British have an agent in question. They say, James Bond's the guy for this, that he is initially hired for the job because he's really good at playing Baccarat. What happens over the course of that story, however, is James Bond actually, he plays well, but he loses and loses all of his money at one point. And just when he is sitting at the table having lost, you know, Baccarat's the famous game where, where the face cards count for nothing and you have to get closest to nine without going over in three cards. And James Bond busts, basically, and he realizes he is out of money. And then at the last minute, he gets a nudge and a, a, and a, uh, an usher hands him a thick envelope. And he opens the envelope, and the envelope is full of 320,000 francs. And there's a note in it from his CIA connection, Felix Leiter, who says, Marshall Plan Assistance. <laughs> and so with that extra injection of cash from the United States, um, James Bond is able to eventually beat Le Chiffre at, at Casino Royale, bankrupt him, and the story goes on from there. Which is very interesting to think about how James Bond uh, connects to uh, the, the special relationship, if you will. Right? There's, a famous, there's a famous poem uh, that was famous in political circles in the late 1940s, um, and it goes like this. Right? In Washington, Lord Halifax once whispered to Lord Keynes, it's true, they have the money bags, but we have all the brains. Um, so the idea that the British would offer a degree of style and dash to help the slightly rough around the edges Americans win the Cold War. It's a big part of James Bond's initial, this is sort of Ian Fleming's attitude towards the Americans comes into play in this, but it's also a big part of the overall story. But when we think about who James Bond is, right, and taking Bond seriously um, is an interesting question, right, because, you know, Ian Fleming himself was very, uh, uh, Ian Fleming was, uh, had a sense of humor about himself and was very self-deprecating. He said that, the, that, um, that his opuscula, as he called them, right, his little works, were, were just adventure stories. Um, and in a sense they were, but they touched a nerve when they came out in the 1950s. They touched a nerve in Britain about a spy who was so suave, remember when, when, when Casino Royale was written in 1953. Britain is still in the midst of, of rationing. Britain is still in the midst of, of post-war, let's say, austerity. And so the idea of a spy, that the, the novels are full of references to how well James Bond eats, to how he dresses, to how he drinks, to how he travels, um, that there was a sort of wish fulfillment element, disconnected from politics but was really reflecting a, a British desire to believe that even though the United Kingdom might have lost its empire, even though the United Kingdom might be coming down in the world somewhat, that the United Kingdom was still essential to the Western defense against communism, even if it was essential because they had people who knew how to order cocktails and play Baccarat. But it's very interesting to know, and there is, there is, I gotta tell you, right, this is something that I have learned myself, right, there is a, like a, a large and growing literature about the James Bond novels, the James Bond films, what they say about contemporary culture, what they say about the Cold War. It is a real and growing field of study um, in a way that I think James Bond actually uh, is ahead of Sherlock Holmes as far as this, right? I am unaware of there being the same level of scholarly interest in Sherlock Holmes that there is in James Bond. Um, and so, uh, but that's something to, to keep in mind. Now, um, I, I love this, the behind the scenes, right? This is the behind the scenes shot of, at the beginning of the Don, Daniel Craig film, um, uh, Casino Royale, right? As you know, James Bond's first kill takes place in a very unpleasant place, right? In a, in a, men's, in a men's room in, in, in 2012. Um, but 
but which Bond, right? That's the question, right? This is, this is Ian Fleming is right here, right, the creator. Um, this is uh, Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, who were the two producers who create the James Bond films. I often get them confused. If I got them the other way around, you can double check on that. Um, and you recognize this fella here with wearing his hairpiece is um, Sir Sean Connery, right? So that was when the decision was made to make films. But there are 271 Bond stories. That's the novels and the short stories that Ian Fleming wrote and the continuation novels that have been approved by his, by Ian Fleming's estate since 1964. Um, there are 28 uh, uh, distinct different incarnations of Bond across the novels, movies, TV, and comic strips. I actually have a, an example of the James Bond comic strip, which ran in the Daily Express for 25 years. Um, that uh, James Bond, there, there are a lot of James Bonds. Um, this is a picture of Sir Sean Connery without his hairpiece, right, in the late 1970s when he's talking with, this is Kevin McClory here, who was Ian Fleming's collaborator on the script for Thunderball. Um, but he and Fleming had a big disagreement over who should get credit for it. And so after the movie Thunderball was made, McClory sued Ian Fleming, because Fleming then produced a, a novelization of the script as a novel. And McClory said, you can't do that because I wrote the script. And so McGlory was allowed to hold on to the story of Thunderball to make another movie. Now, he tries in the late 70s to make a version of it with Sir Sean. They don't. But in the early 1980s, you may remember this. In 1983, there are actually two James Bond movies are produced. Octopussy, which is starring Roger Moore, which was in the Harry Saltzman, Cubby Broccoli uh, continuum. And Never Say Never Again, which was with Sean Connery, Kim Basinger, and Barbara Carrera and Klaus Maria Brandauer as the villain, which was a complete remake of the movie Thunderball, but it was made um, so that Kevin McClory could make a little extra money off of the Ian Fleming estate. The things that you know. Um, the study of James Bond, I, I really love this picture because first of all, you know, Roger Moore is perhaps one of the coolest individuals ever to live on this planet. And so the idea that he would be sitting drinking a glass of champagne while something's going on over here. <laughs> Um, that's a great behind the scenes shot. Um, that's, during, that's during the making of, of the first film with Roger Moore, The Man with the Golden Gun. Or, or, or Live and Let Die, I'm sorry, the first, uh, the first one. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, my battery is running low, sorry. You might want to plug in your PC, they say. Uh-oh. I have to bring Q in to fix this problem. <laughs> what do you think? There we go. You just tapped out again. I just tapped. Okay, that's cool. Awesome. We're good now. In um, in Goldfinger which is the first time that Bond actually has a long conversation with Desmond Llewellyn playing Q. There's a famous moment where, where Q says, you know, Bond, I hope that you will bring this material back from the field. And Bond responds, well, Q, you have no idea how much wear and tear happens out in the field. <laughs> um, so that's one thing. And that also is when, when Q shows him the famous Aston Martin with the ejector seat. And, and Bond, says, Bond says, ejector seat, you must be joking. And Q says, completely deadpan, and this, what, this is why Desmond Llewellyn appeared in every movie after this, is he says deadpan, I never joke about my work, 007. <laughs> so I'm not going to joke about his about work here either. Anyway, when we talk about you know, what has been produced, right, that there are, these are just, this is, a, this is a sampling of the scholarship on James Bond that has been created since Ian Fleming died in 1964. Right, beginning with Kingsley Amos, who's a very famous English author, wrote the James Bond dossier in the early 1960s. He was a friend of Ian Fleming and actually wrote the first post-Fleming James Bond novel, Colonel Sun, which was published in 1968, although Amos published it under a pseudonym. Um, but since then, there's been a variety of studies of James Bond, people sort of expressing their, their interest in it, biographies of Fleming, 
Um, it is a, as I say, it is a, it is a big and growing field, which we could talk about. But I want to move along. I want to talk about the issue of James Bond and the Cold War, which, which was the original title of, of this particular talk. Right? This, this nice little behind the scenes shot, this is during the filming of, of uh, I should ask you, but I'll, but I'll tell you, of uh, You Only Live Twice, which is the James Bond film that takes place in Japan. Um, and uh, uh, and it get, you get a chance, a, a, a chance to see sort of everybody there. But here's a sense of, these are the books written by Fleming. Right? So between 1953 with Casino Royale and 1965, The Man with the Golden Gun, which actually was not quite complete, but Fleming dies in 1964, and so, and so about a year later, they, they, they published The Man with the Golden Gun, which was a mostly finished novel. Some people will tell you it's not all that terrific, and it's actually kind of problematic as a novel. He published also a, um, a collection of short stories, which were collected from his writings, which um, stories that had appeared in Playboy magazine and other magazines came out in 1966. But this is the, so this is the, the, this is the original Bond canon. Right, and this is the order in which they're published. And so, what's really interesting is that obviously the order of the novels is not the same as the order of the films. Um, and that was there's a variety of questions about that, about about uh, about rights and about deciding, you know, so what would work best for the uh, for the audience. And this list actually only goes up to Goldeneye in 1995, um, which was um, when Pierce Brosnan comes on as James Bond, which kind of rescued the the Bond, uh, the Bond series, right? There are these there are these major inflection points in the James Bond series, right? It's the first, you know, Doctor No from Rush with Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, You Only Live Twice. Those are the original Sean Connery, James Bond films. After You Only Live Twice, Sean Connery said, "I'm tired of playing James Bond. I don't care how much you want to pay me. I don't want to do it anymore." And so Saltzman and Broccoli hire the Australian model George Lazenby to play James Bond in On Her Majesty's Secret Service in 1969. We can have a discussion about this in the Q&A, but I will tell you that uh, in my opinion, all right, On Her Majesty's Secret Service is perhaps the second best James Bond film, right? It has, it has a great obscure Baroque plot. It has the best villain, which is Telly Savalas, plays Ernst Stavro Blofeld as the head of Spectre. It has the best leading lady, Diana Rigg, plays Tracy DiLorenzo, who is the daughter of the leader of the Corsican Mafia, who falls in love with James Bond and is the only woman James Bond ever marries, which happens in that film. And then she is, spoiler alert, murdered at the very end of the story. The only weak spot in On Her Majesty's Secret Service is George Lazenby himself, who's actually not that bad. But he's not, but at the time, of course, he wasn't Sean Connery and he took a lot of heat for this. And basically he made one film and even though they offered him a ton of money to make more, he said, no thanks, I don't want to do it anymore. And so two years later, Sean Connery comes back one more time for Diamonds Are Forever. They offer, they basically back up the truck <laughs> for Sean Connery. They say, we want you back, we need the money. And he says, I'll do it, but you have to pay me a million dollars and you, United Artists, have to promise to make at least two movies of my choosing. Because Connery right now wanted to be a serious actor. And actually, one of the movies that is made as a result of, of this deal is, the, is a movie called The Offense, where Connery plays a British policeman who is broken down by life. It's a very hardcore story where he, he arrests a man uh, 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 he arrests a, a, a man convicted of uh, uh, or accused of child molestation. And he, he basically is so broken down by life that he ends up murdering the suspect, right? So this is a movie that's so completely beyond James Bond, right? It's completely serious, right? That Sean Connery wanted to make this movie and he made this movie. And this was the beginning of Sean Connery's life as a serious actor. But he puts the hairpiece on one more time and he plays James Bond in, in Diamonds Are Forever. Um, and then he says, okay, now I really am done. And that's when then the Eon company, right, uh, Saltzman and Broccoli, they bring in Roger Moore, who had become very famous in, uh, uh, in, on television for playing the saint, Simon Templer, and had made a series of other movies and, and, so, and, and TV shows. And so Roger Moore plays James Bond for the next decade and a half. 
between Live and Let Die in 1973 and A View to a Kill in 1985. Um, it's interesting, you, you, if you go and you look and you see, you know, actors who were, who were considered to play James Bond and who for one reason or another ended up not playing, apparently at the very beginning, one of the, one of the uh, serious contenders to play James Bond was, was John Gavin. People of a certain age might know John Gavin. He was a uh, he he is he plays the uh, the male lead in Psycho. Um, he was actually a uh, uh, a very well known actor. Was a good friend of another actor, Ronald Reagan, and was Ronald Reagan's ambassador to Mexico um, in the 1980s. John Gavin was considered for uh, James Bond, but he never does play him. Um, um, but after after uh, let's say after Roger Moore hangs it up. There's a big, there, there's a bit of a break, right? And they, they eventually settle on Timothy Dalton, who plays James Bond for just two films, um, uh, The Living Daylights and License to Kill. Um, Timothy Dalton's a very fine actor, very nice looking guy, actually very good for the role in a lot of ways, but he was, the, those two films are among the grimmest and saddest and most violent Bond films. And everybody was like, this is not working. We need to find somebody else. And so they go and they find Pierce Brosnan whom they had wanted instead of Timothy Dalton back in 1985, but they couldn't get because he was under contract filming his television series, Remington Steel. Um, and so Brosnan comes back and he plays James Bond for several films, right? Not just Goldeneye, but for, for several after that, until he finally decides he's had enough. And then once again, Eon has this kind of question, what are we gonna do? And that's when they find Daniel Craig. And that's also when they decide to reboot the whole series and imagine it starting from the beginning all over again. So that's why Daniel Craig's first James Bond film in 2006 is Casino Royale. So basically they take, even though they, they make changes to the plot, right? They, they, they're not playing Baccarat in the film Casino Royale, they're playing poker. We, I know, right? Um, <laughs> Um, but, the, but, but otherwise, what, what's fascinating is, is that the film Casino Royale in, with Daniel Craig follows the plot of the novel actually quite closely um, to sort of start it all over again to get you ready where Bond, Bond comes from. And then they get into this whole debate over you know, the rest of the films, right? From, from Casino Royale to Quantum of Solace to, um, to uh, Skyfall to Spectre to No Time to Die. Those are the Daniel Craig, James Bond films, right? It becomes a story arc for James Bond uh, to gradually live through his entire life, right? We see him from the beginning of his time as a spy to at the end of No Time to Die. We're pretty sure James Bond has been killed. Spoiler alert. Um, but the idea of, of continually trying to sort of reboot and rethink the story is also related to this idea of trying to figure out, you know, so what does James Bond represent? And does James Bond represent the Cold War? Because the fascinating thing is, while that first novel, Casino Royale, and the very first, the very beginning of the whole series is very much within the Cold War and is very connected to issues of, of the Soviet Union and, 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 and the Cold War, that uh, the novels themselves begin to move away from the Cold War by the early 1960s, and the films from the beginning avoid specific valences with the Cold War. If you watch Dr. No, the film, one of the reasons why they chose to make that the first film was because Dr. No doesn't work for the commies. Dr. No works for Spectre, the special executive for counterintelligence, terrorism, revenge, and extortion. <laughs> I mean, Right, and there's actually a scene at in in Doctor No's lair, where James Bond asks, you know, do you work for the East or the West? And Doctor No is played by Joseph Wiseman, very good actor. Says, East and West, two points of the compass, equally silly, equally pointless. Right. So the idea that the enemy Spectre is somehow above, beyond, outside the Cold War is dangerous to everybody. Um, and you will notice this comes up again and again in the Bond novels, right? Who are the villains in many of the Bond, and, and the films, I should say. Who are the villains in the films, right? They are, they are megalomaniacal multimillionaires, right? Over and over and over again. Um, and there are actually several films in which Bond cooperates with the Soviets in order to defeat these megalomaniacal millionaires. In, in The Spy Who Loved Me, for example, um, Bond actually uh, works with the which agent with Agent Triple X of the KGB, played by Barbara Bach. 
at the end of the film, at the end of the film, A View to a Kill, which is uh, the plot revolves around a megalomaniacal multi-billionaire named Max Zorin who wants to flood Silicon Valley to destroy the production of computer chips. 1985, that apparently seemed like a sensible plot, I don't know. <laughs> um, Christopher Walken plays Max Zorin, by the way, which is also crazy. Um, but at the very end of that film, the big joke at the end, is after Bond has defeated Zorin, has killed him, has saved Silicon Valley by destroying his blimp from the top of the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, you, get, you had to be there. <laughs> At the very end of the film, there's a scene in M's office where the Soviet ambassador is there who is opening up and shows the Order of Lenin, which is being awarded to Commander Bond and when M says, why are you giving Bond the Order of Lenin, he said, the, the Soviet ambassador says, well, if, if Silicon Valley were destroyed, where would the Soviet Union get its computer chips? Um, which is a very interesting moment, right, in the films, right? The, the idea that the Cold War is essentially irrelevant. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, and even a more interesting scene, I always have to mention this too, is, is that an underappreciated James Bond film, and as I say, I could talk for on and on, I promise I'm not going to talk much longer, but I could talk on and on. An underappreciated James Bond film, one of the last Roger Moore films, is For Your Eyes Only, which is in some ways a very simple Cold War style plot, a piece of technology, um, a, uh, a device that's used to encrypt messages from the Royal Navy to uh, the Ministry of Defense, is lost in a storm off the coast of Greece. It has been discovered by somebody who wants to sell it to the Soviets. James Bond has to get it back. Um, at the end of the film, my Bond has managed to get it back and he is holding the device, but he's all by himself as the Soviets arrive to collect it from the bad guy. <clears throat> and so Bond is standing there as the, the Soviet agent, whoever he is, gets off this, this helicopter with guys carrying guns. And Bond stands there and he then, he looks, he looks in both directions and then he takes the device and he flings it off the top of the cliff where he's standing and it crashes into a million pieces below. And Roger Moore, as James Bond says to the Soviet representative, that's detente, comrade. You don't have it. I don't have it. The Soviet guy laughs, gets back up on his helicopter and leaves, right? James Bond has saved the day, if you will. But this idea, right, you know, the interesting question of why are James Bond stories not about the Cold War? This was a business decision. As early as the 1950s, when, when Fleming was still alive, he says, I want to sell these stories around the world. If I make them all about the Cold War, the Cold War is going to end someday. And in fact, might already be over. Like there were people saying in the late 1950s after the death of Stalin, who knows, right? There won't be a Cold War anymore. So these aren't going to be Cold War stories. And the movie makers in particular, right, the guys at Eon, right, they decide that they don't want to make this about the Cold War because you know, as you know, Michael Jordan famously was asked why he didn't make political statements. And he said, Republicans buy sneakers too. <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, in a sense, right, for Eon, right, to flip it around, right, is, uh, is, you know, when Eon was asked, you know, do you want to make this about the Cold War? It's like, well, you know, people in Eastern Europe buy movie tickets too. And so the idea that James Bond becomes a global brand that you know, in a weird way, right, can transcend the Cold War is the fact that he was never really just about the Cold War. Even though you could argue that the world that James Bond represented is part of a larger, let's say, Western offensive in order to encourage people on the other side of the Iron Curtain to appreciate sort of how good living was in the West. Anyway, um, the, uh, one of the fascinating things that came out in the conference that I just have to talk about very briefly is James Bond becomes so popular that as early as the 1960s in Eastern Europe, there are various efforts to create espionage stories that compete with James Bond, right? This, this poster here is from Cold Season, which was a Soviet uh, espionage story from the 1960s about a Soviet agent in the West. Uh-oh, oh, I think the computer did die. All right. Um, 
but the idea that in the East there were a series of efforts to present images of spies, right? There is a, there's this movie called Season, there is, a, there is an Eastern European television series, 17 Seasons of Spring, which is about the, the exploits of a communist agent in the West. There is a, there's actually a series of Soviet films called Sword and Shield, which takes the, which is the, the, uh, the symbol of the KGB. Um, and makes that agent a hero for the Soviet Union. Fame, one young man claimed that it was because of his interest in, the, uh, in those films that he decided to join the KGB and eventually grow up to become the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. Um, and so James Bond and the way that James Bond is talked about and the image of James Bond, right, this becomes a big part of Cold War culture, but not necessarily connected to any side in the Cold War. Even though he's originally born, you know, there is this, there's this huge popularity of spy stories in the 1960s that James Bond is both, is both cause and effect of, right? The James Bond films draw on existing sort of espionage thrillers, and then there's a, there are, there's a huge market for Bond knockoffs, for Bond, uh, for Bond imitators, <clears throat> Not just in, in Europe, there's a whole series of Euro spy films. On American television, right, you can watch The Man from Uncle, for example, one of the great uh, television shows, which is very James Bond, also completely disconnected from the Cold War, right? Because even though Napoleon Solo, played by Robert Vaughn, is very clearly an American, who is his sidekick? His sidekick is Ilya Kuryakin, played by David McCallum, who is, in some ways, a Russian. Right, so this idea that it's espionage that is exciting, and it's the idea of the, the secret agent um, is exciting. Right? James Bond, there are secret agents before James Bond, there are secret agents after James Bond, but there is nobody who can quite top James Bond. And so I want to read you the last paragraph of our book, which is our last chapter, which talks about how Bond, uh, at the end of every James Bond film, at the end of every James Bond film in the 1960s and 1970s, it would always end with, after the credits, it would say, James Bond will return. And it would usually give the name of the next James Bond film. Sometimes that's actually not true. Sometimes they don't make that film. But, but the idea is, no matter what happened to James Bond, he always came back, right? This is the connection to Doctor Who, let's say. It doesn't matter if he dies, because somebody else will come back and play James Bond, right? Sherlock Holmes died. Right? Uh, and came back, right? Conan Doyle killed him off and brought him back. Ian Fleming killed off James Bond twice. At the end of the novel From Russia with Love, and at the end of the novel You Only Live Twice, James Bond appears to be dead, but he always comes back. Um, and so one of the fascinating things is the fact that he is so, uh, that he is so hardy, let's say. So here's, here's, here's the last paragraph of the book. What is past is prologue. And even as we await the next wave of renovations in the bond averse, we can continue to reflect on what Bond has meant for readers and viewers and cultural consumers of many lands and many ages. This collection has made its contribution to that process of reflection, and there will be much more to say. The world has not yet been enough for James Bond. He has not left us for long, and he will return even if we don't, do not know exactly how or when. He has all the time in the world. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Ron. That was fantastic. Thank you. So I, I did not give this um, instruction prior to, but most of you know the ropes here with questions, and, and I was someone gave me a text and reminded me the last time I didn't give this instruction, we did have a lecture from one of our questions. So I will remind you, um, a question should be a couple of sentences, and if you can't put a question mark at the end of it, you have failed. <laughs> so do we have some questions uh, for Pro Professor Guerrero? Uh, Jason, if you would. Thanks. Hi. Do you think that John le Carre wrote his much more serious and somber spy stories as a response to Fleming's? Yes. I, I, this, I think, is a very fascinating point, is that the popularity of spy novels in the 1960s sort of pulls in a bunch of different directions. 
Um, and there had been, like, La Carre writes his first novels. They're not actually spy novels, right? His first couple of novels, which he writes while he's still working for the Secret Service, A Call for the Dead, A Murder of Quality, are essentially murder mysteries with a spy at the center, George Smiley. But, by, but he writes those stories in 1962 and 63. Then James, you know, so James Bond exists, he knows of it, but it's after Dr. No that he thinks, right now, um, I will write a story that's based on my own experience in the Secret Service. And that's when he writes The Spy Who Came In From the Cold, which is very clearly not James Bondian. What is interesting is the film is produced, uh, or the production designer of the film, Ken Adam, is the same guy who, who did the production design on Goldfinger. So even though The Spy Who Came From the Cold is in black and white and it's very grim, like exceedingly grim. But no, I think this is interesting. There is a dialogue, if you will, right? Even, even authors um, who want to say they're, do, they're not doing James Bond, they're clearly in dialogue with James Bond, right? Every time you write a spy story and the spy turns down a martini, you all know what's going on, right? Or every time you do a spy story and the spy doesn't get the girl, right? That, you know, that is a... They're talking about James Bond even when they're not talking about James Bond. And that's the interesting thing is that, that contemporary spy agencies have always had trouble with the James Bond image. Because on the one hand, right, they'll say, right, there's no James Bonds in the CIA, which is true. There are no James Bonds in the CIA. Um, but there was a point at which the CIA did a recruiting video where they hired Jennifer Garner, um, fresh off of her success playing an alias, to encourage young people to think about signing up for the CIA. So there is this interesting dialogue, but it is, it is fascinating, right? Is the, the anti-Bond and Bond exist in a tight relationship with each other. Um, and that's, that's, it's always a fun thing to sort of see how that works. Because like, one, one last thing, John, I'm sorry, that, the, um, that there's Len Dayton, who was an, an English spy novelist um, who wrote a lot of very serious novels, right? And one of his greatest spy novels is The Ipcrest File, which, he, which is made into a film with Michael Caine. And the hero of Len Dayton's stories, The Ipcrest File, um, Funeral in Berlin, Billion Dollar Brain, is the spy Harry Palmer, who is a working class bloke, and very much that way, even wears glasses. Um, that, um, that Dayton writes him definitely as a, uh, a non-James Bond. Those three films are produced by Harry Saltzman and Cubby Broccoli, right? the same people who made the James Bond films. They come out around the same time. So there's like the sense of it's all part of the same game, if you will. Yeah. Doctor, thank you for the lovely presentation. Really appreciate you it's sharing my, this with us. It's my pleasure. I'm going to ask you a compound question. All right. The first is, when you consider your own life, aside from these creations, how has James Bond impacted you in the most significant manner? The second question is, would you care to dive down the rabbit hole that is Ian Fleming and how he came to uh, James Bond? Well, two things. One is, I would say that I can remember the first James Bond movie I ever saw. I wa it was on ABC television in 1975, and it was because ABC had made a deal with United Artists to show the James Bond films on the ABC movie of the week. The first film I ever saw was Goldfinger. And I have to say, right, Goldfinger is the platonic ideal of the James Bond novel, right, or James Bond film. And I watched it with my father, who said, you're going to love this. And I did, right? And I would say that in a whole bunch of odd ways, right, a particular interest in international travel, a particular interest in international politics, right, it starts, it, it starts with James Bond, which is really kind of funny to think about. But it's definitely, it's definitely there. Now, with Ian Fleming, right, the interesting question about Ian Fleming is you know, Ian Fleming knew everybody, right? Ian Fleming was friendly with, uh, with serious novelists. He was friendly with Graham Greene, who also wrote spy novels as a sideline in addition to his, his other work. Fleming worked for, for British intel naval intelligence during the Second World War. Fleming may indeed have been involved in all kinds of interesting uh, underground operations. Um, and and he was not the first member of the British Secret Service to write novels. This was actually a thing that they did, right? So in that sense, like Ian Fleming and John le Carré, both of them, this is a lot of spy work is boring routine, which means you have a lot of free time to write novels, <laughs> which is oddly enough. And so, 
Um, Fleming is this interesting character, right? So the question is always, right, you know, who are the real life comparisons for these people? And I, I recommend Andrew Lysett's biography of Ian Fleming. If you haven't had a chance to read it, it's quite interesting on these kinds of questions. Um, but in the end, right, what's interesting too is Fleming came, Fleming came from a family that had been very wealthy but that had fallen on hard times. And one of the things that's very true in the 1950s is he is determined to make money. And so that's why he sees the James Bond stories as, you know, yes, it's a chance for him to sort of talk about some of his intelligence work, but he also sees it as a chance to make a pile of cash. And that's why what's very interesting is that the idea of James Bond as the sort of multimedia character is present from the beginning. That Fleming is already, he's writing the novels, but he's already thinking about how these are going to work as movies. And he's already in negotiations with the Daily Express about the comic strip. And he's already trying to think about radio dramas and all these kinds of things. And so it, that's what I think is very interesting, right? There's that, that, that Fleming is kind of, you know, delightfully straightforward about the fact that he's in this for the money. Um, even, even little things, like the, the, I mentioned the man from UNCLE, right? The man from UNCLE, he'd originally pitched this idea to an American television producer. But then eventually he, quit, he was so busy with the films and he was also, his health was declining, so he doesn't get involved in it. But the, the interesting connection is that the main character of the man from UNCLE, Napoleon Solo. Solo is the name of one of the characters in Goldfinger. He's actually the name of one of the mobsters that gold, that, that, that's there with Goldfinger, the one who gets crushed in, um, in the car with all the gold. And when, at the end, when Goldfinger says, I have to go separate Mr. Solo from, it, from my gold. Um, but um, so in that sense, right, it, it's fascinating to see how, how all over the place Fleming is, even though he's really just in this to make as much money as possible. And so Fleming would be delighted to see how long, how long this has gone on, even though the Fleming estate does pretty well, but the Broccoli estate does even better because Barbara Broccoli is still the, the, the main producer of the James Bond films, the, the daughter of Cubby. Question right over here. Hi, hey, sir, it's uh, Tony Gray from Universal Exports. Uh, <laughs> in your opinion, which of the cinematic bonds reflect the Ian Fleming novel yeah. bond? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm glad somebody asked this question because I struggle with this one. I was trying to decide how to answer it, right? In an odd way, even though he gets all kinds of negative press, right? Timothy Dalton comes very close to being the way James Bond is initially described, right? Ian Fleming describes Bond as having a hard, a cruel, hard mouth, and essentially Bond is a killer. Right, and so what's funny is, is that once it gets put up on the movies, right, everybody wants Bond to be suave and not hard like Timothy Dalton. And so that I think is interesting. When, one, of the, one of the funny things is people say, you know, what was James Bond supposed to look like? There's only one living person that Ian Fleming specifically references. And that is, uh, I, believe it's in, I, I believe it's in Diamonds Are Forever but it might be elsewhere too, is that James Bond is supposed to look like Hoagie Carmichael. So if you know Hoagie Carmichael, right, the musician who wrote Stardust, um, if you've ever seen the film The Best Years of Our Lives, he plays the pianist friend of the veterans in that. And he was a, a, a tall, lean guy with a shock of dark hair, and B Fleming always refers to Bond has a comma of dark hair hanging down over his forehead. Um, and so that's an odd thing, right? Why Hoagie Carmichael? Right? Not some sport, not some um, some athlete, not some other famous actor, and so so he imagined Bond as being uh, this sort of you know tough, hard guy. So Sean Connery is, comes pretty close, but the way Connery plays Bond is a little too uh, a little too smooth. Um, even though even though we know that Fleming only lived long enough to see two Bond films made. Um, so he saw Dr. No from Russia with Love. He was apparently pretty pleased with how they went, even though Sean Connery was not his choice to play James Bond. I have one last question here. Take a more worthy person. <laughs> a, more, a more worthy person. <laughs> <That was good>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, again for this exposition, you started out by pointing out, and you just mentioned it again in that answer, that he was an assassin. Yes. So I missed that, that 
every, in every one of the films and every one of the books, his, his assignment, whatever it was, was to kill, kill somebody. Usually. Yeah. I mean, it usually was to eliminate you know, a particular target. That's right. I mean, it's, it's a funny thing, right? Because um, you know, part of the plots of the novels and certainly of the films is, is you know, he's given this sort of this vague, you know, somebody's doing something, we got to find out who it is and get them to stop doing that, right? Um, it's a little more specific um, in the novels, but there is this idea that you know, Bond is not there just to collect information, right? He is there to eliminate a problem. And, and so that's, that's an element of the, of the plot that, you know, there's a, you know, what, one, of the, one of my favorite conversations in the James Bond films is in, in The Man with the Golden Gun. Roger Moore's James Bond is having lunch with Scaramanga, the assassin played by Christopher Lee, who's one of the great Bond villains, because he's one of the great villains of all time. And in the conversation, right, you know, Bond is saying that Scaramanga is an assassin who kills people a million dollars a hit. And Bond makes clear that he finds this distasteful. And Christopher Lee has this famous line that, that, that's repeated all the time. Come, come, Mr. Bond. You know that you enjoy, you disappoint me. You know that you enjoy killing just as much as I do. And Bond responds, right? You know, this is you know, this is Roger Moore trying to be a tough guy, and, and I, I I like Roger Moore, but it's always funny to watch him try to sound tough, because he says, "When I kill, it is for my queen and my country, but I would definitely enjoy killing you." <laughs> Ron, I I have one question. Bring actually. it, John. <laughs> I, I my favorite part of I think most of the movies is the music. Yes, yes, and yes. they're so identifiable with the movie. You can. Yes. Yes. Talk to me about the music and how it came to be and the theme in particular. You know, you just reminded me of something that my, my co-author, Martin Brown, we were talking yesterday that I told him I was going to come and do this. Um, and, and he was, you know, Martin lives in London, so of course he couldn't come here. Martin is, of course, much cooler than I am. We are, we are James Bond and Felix Leiter, right? I just sort of <laughs> hang around him. Um, but, um, but he said that when he, when he makes his presentations to university audiences, he says at the beginning, he says, all right, everybody, I want you to take a minute and I want you to start humming the James Bond theme to yourself as we get started. And he says, if you do that, the audience is eaten out of your hand. <laughs> so I didn't do that tonight. I'm sorry about that. It's a funny thing, right? Is the, the, Monty, the original Monty Norman guitar lick from James Bond, right? right? That's actually from a song written for an Indian action film. Because um, it's originally played on a sitar. Which you can, when you think about the way it sounds on a guitar, right? It sounds kind of like that. But it was, but Monty Norman sort of handed the lick over to John Barry, who's a very famous film, uh, film uh, uh, music guy, and Barry sort of built it, built around it to make the James Bond theme that we are, that that we know today. It's also worth noting that for On Her Majesty's Secret Service, right? Because well, one thing is you might realize that um, Doctor No only has the James Bond theme as its music. After that, the producers of the film began to realize that as the films became sort of larger cultural touchstones, there was the idea that theme songs could be another way to market the film. And so that's why you get From Russia With Love, which is, a, which is sung by, oh man. Right, thank you, <laughs> who said that? Yeah, that's right. But then, but then, um, but then uh, and then of course, they really hit it big with Shirley Bassey singing Goldfinger, right? And so you've got Shirley Bassey sings Goldfinger, um, and then after that for, for Thunderball is Tom Jones sings Thunderball, Nancy Sinatra sings You Only Live Twice. Um, when they made On Her Majesty's Secret Service, right, because they really felt as though they were rebooting the whole series, they asked John Barry to write an instrumental theme for On Her Majesty's Secret Service. So there's no song to On Her Majesty's Secret Service, but there's actually a very good instrumental theme, which if you watch the beginning of that film, but the famous thing about it is Bond is, uh, George Lazenby is trying to rescue Diana Rigg from being attacked and murdered. And he rescues her, but then at the last minute, while he's busy fighting off the bad guys, she runs off, steals James Bond's car, and drives off. And, and George Lazenby turns and looks at the camera and says, well, that never happened to the other fella. <laughs> Which is this one moment of sort of breaking the fourth wall, right? So that, I mean, we're, we're getting this out of the way at the beginning, right? It's, he's not Sean Connery. And then it goes into this instrumental theme, which 
over the credits to uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, they show clips from all the James Bond films that existed then. So it's really interesting, right? As old as that film is now, is at the time it was kind of a, you know, uh, let's look back on all this. And then when they bring in Sean, when they bring in Roger Moore, they go back to the idea of having, you know, usually the most important pop singer of the era sings the James Bond theme, right? Because you think about who's done the James Bond themes, right? You know, Shirley Bassey comes back to do Diamonds Are Forever, which is terrific. But then you've got Paul McCartney and Wings do Live and Let Die. Uh, uh, eventually you have Duran Duran, which was a big star in the 1980s. They do A View to a Kill. Madonna will sing a, uh, Madonna sings a uh, James Bond theme. Uh, Adele sings the theme to Skyfall, one of the great James Bond themes, right? The idea that this is, this sort of adds to the idea of the James Bond films as a kind of multimedia empire activity. I have to tell I have to tell two funny stories about James Bond. Like if I can hold off dinner on just a little bit longer. Please. Two funny stories. <laughs> Early days, right? Shirley Bassey singing Goldfinger is one of the greatest opening songs you're ever going to hear in a movie. If you ever listen to it, you'll notice that at the end she hits the final note of Goldfinger and holds it for an incredibly long time. The story is she tried that over and over again in the studio and never was quite happy with it. And finally she said, hold on a second. She excused herself for a few minutes and then came back and sang the song again all the way through and hit the note at the end and just blew everybody away. And they said, Shirley, what did you do? And she says, I went in the ladies' room and I removed my brassiere so I could breathe better. <laughs> Which is a very James Bond story. The second James Bond story that, that fits in with that is Tom Jones sings the theme song to Thunderball, which is one of the oddest songs because, you know, the, the, the big line in it is, is, you know, he often, he often runs while others walk, he often acts while others talk, um, and it also, he strikes like Thunderball, which makes no sense whatsoever. But when you listen to Tom Jones sing it, he sings it with such incredible conviction. And he also, at the very end of Thunderball, he hits the final note and he holds it for this really big long time. And famously, he did not go take off his brassiere. Famously, in the recording, Tom Jones, when he sang the final cut of Thunderball, is when he hit that final note, he holds it, he holds it, he holds it, he holds it, he holds it and when they finally, when the, when the musician, the musicians come in and hit that final note, boom, he passed out unconscious. So he gave his all in order to sing Thunderball. So people are into that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Carneri. Ron, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. For something completely different, please come on Monday. Presidential impeachments with Michael Gerhardt. I promise it will be enlightening uh, and it will be entertaining, although that, Ron, will be hard to top. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great night.